Okay, so here's our third part for our marine ecology lecture. And the thing I want you guys to keep in mind with this chapter of marine ecology, this is just kind of broad picture examples, things that we see occurring. As we get into our chapter on coral reefs, we're going to talk about specific types of marine interactions. So we're talking about symbiosis, this both species benefit, commensalism, one gains, no impact on the other, and parasitism. When we get into coral reefs and we start talking about specific organisms, then we're going to look at ex you know, very, very defined examples of mutualism. Like, ooh, let's look for this in the coral reef. Ooh, here's an example of parasitism. Let's look for that, and so on and so forth. So this, again, this chapter, this, these lectures right here with marine ecology are just kind of overview lectures, not getting into the example scenario as much as I'd like. I'll be doing that in our later lectures. So last lecture we left off at this symbiosis point. Species living together and we talked about three types of symbiosis. Now there are two terms that are associated with symbiosis, two kind of specific types. One is called facultative. This is when the individual, well let's go with organisms, the organisms can survive without their, we'll call it, partner, all right? So the, um, the idea behind facultative, yeah, they, they work together, they have a partnership, they're associated, but if one of them is gone, it's not going to, the other one's not going to die. It can survive because maybe it has other relationships or the relationship is not uh, so connected that you're completely dependent upon the other species. So if you take a look at the eel on the right over here, that moray eel is getting cleaned by a cleaner shrimp. That's facultative symbiosis, specifically a cleaning symbiosis. And they're working together. Now if the shrimp disappears, the eel is going to get cleaned by another cleaner organism, maybe a, shrimp, a fish, cleaner fish, or some other organism that also does cleaning. If the eel disappears, that shrimp's going to keep cleaning other individuals, other species, other organisms. So neither of these two species in this relationship will die or suffer significantly if the other partner disappears. Now, an obligate obligate symbiosis the way obligate symbiosis works is you will not survive if the other partner disappears you're dead so coral bleaching so we got healthy coral on the left down here and we have coral that's been bleached. So the zoanthelae leaves the coral. Coral's going to die. It's not going to survive. It cannot grab enough food out of the water to support itself, to survive, and to be sustained. So it dies. That's obligate symbiosis. You are obligated or dependent upon your partner for your survival. So that can, long term, that can be problematic if your partner disappears. Right, so anytime we're looking at ecosystems and ecology and all these interactions, we want to look at energy flow. How does energy move through an ecosystem? This is what we call the trophic structure. Okay, so basic movement of energy from one level to the next, to the next, to the next. So we have two broad categories for organisms when we talk about this energy flow and trophic structure. Category one are called your producers, primary producers. Okay, primary producers or autotrophs are organisms that make their own food. They run photosynthesis. That's the big key here, by and large. They run photosynthesis, some of them do a chemosynthesis, but they're not eating something else. They're running a 
metabolic process to make energy through sunlight or through a chemical process. So we call them autotrophs. The other big broad category are what we call consumers. Okay, so consumers are, are, are called heterotrophs, and they feed on other organisms. And we talked a bit about this earlier when we talked about carnivores and omnivores and um, herbivores and detritivores. All of those go into the consumer category because they eat other things. They cannot make their own energy. They have to consume other organisms in order to get their energy. So as we look at energy flow and ecosystems, marine ecosystems, we want to look at the food chain idea and the food web idea, and then this thing we call the trophic structure, trophic pyramid, which I'll show you in just a second. Okay, so energy is flowing here. Energy moves from one level of the food chain to the next. So you know, it starts here, goes up, and then it goes up. And depending upon what the organism is here, it may stop there, or that energy may continue to flow up, and all sorts of different ways energy flows. So when we're looking at this energy flow, this is usually the easier way to approach it is you start with your energy <clears throat> here at your producer base that moves up to your first level consumer which then moves up to your second level consumer depending upon the organisms in the food chain so here's our food oh it's not easy with the mouse to try to type here or to write oh let me erase that thinking ahead. All right, so this is the food chain on this side where you go this links to this, which links to this. That's it. Three steps. We're done. But a huge thing, huge, huge, huge thing I want you guys to remember here. When we talk about energy, energy follows this 10% rule of energy transfer. Now, I can't stress how important that is for you guys to remember. On average, 10% of the energy at one level of the food chain or trophic pyramid will go to the next level, 10%. So if you look at the numbers here, this starts out with 10 million calories of energy at the phytoplankton level. A million calories move up to the first level consumers or the krill, these little invertebrates, crustaceans. Then a hundred thousand move up to the whale, and that's what supplies the whale with the energy and the nutrients it needs for survival. So every time we move up, we're only carrying up 10%. So if we went beyond the whale, if we had a way to go up one more level up here, we're going to be down to 10% of that caloric value, that block. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller every time it goes up. This is why when whether we set it up as a pyramid, like what we have over here, or we set it up as the blocks and the arrows, every time you go up, the size of the block or the size of the pyramid section gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, so again, that's moving on, on a 10% rule of energy transfer when we go through food chains. Now, if we jump back here and we go to the food web, oh, this is where it gets a little more complex because how much of the energy from here is going this way versus over to these guys versus over to here. And this is what creates our food web concept. So webs get a lot more complex. But what we want to think about, if we look at a food web, all of these different connections, <clears throat> and then any time we influence or impact or mess with anything in this food web, it produces a ripple effect. So imagine if your krill population crashes because 
disease because of lack of nutrients, lack of phytoplankton or whatever. If this population of krill goes down, small fish are impacted, the copepods are impacted, this bird here called the petrel is impacted, the penguins impacted, krill go up and feed the seal up here. I mean, obviously our baleen whales would have a huge impact. And then everything that's connected to the seal, the crab eater seal, is impacted. Everything that's connected to the petrel is impacted. Everything that's connected to the squid and small fish is impacted. Okay, so that's why when we look at webs, we want to try to get more comfortable with all of the different connections across the webs. So, all right, but a key thing when we're looking at an ecosystem is measuring the primary productivity of the system. How much energy is at the base of the system? How much is being produced over and over and over and over? So we start with this term called primary production. Okay. All right, so primary production is looking at how much organic matter, energy, is left over after the producers meet their needs. And basically, they, this sets the base of the pyramid, the base of the food chain. How much energy is there? How, much, how many calories? We often measure it in calories of energy. Or sometimes you'll see it measured as kilocalories of energy. Okay, so we get primary productivity or production measured. Like, so that's kind of establishing the base. And then we also want to look at this thing called standing stock. How much phytoplankton is there? What's the total amount of phytoplankton associated with a particular marine ecosystem or marine area? So these are important things to keep in mind when we're looking at energy production in a marine system because certain parts of the marine system have more energy. They have higher primary productivity. They have higher organic matter because they have a bigger producer base. So some regions of the ocean are actually considered deserts because there is so little energy there. That's why we don't see a lot of life there. Other regions exploded when we look at the amount of energy. So check out this picture. Here's net primary productivity of the global oceans when we measure it in grams of carbon per square meter per year. Red indicates higher levels of energy, blue indicates lower. So you look and oh my goodness, you know, the bulk of the ocean, there's no energy there. There's just no energy. So look, all these regions here, there's hardly any energy associated with this part of the ocean. So that's why we don't see a lot of life out there. It's just open ocean, water, very little plankton, very little production, hardly anything. But as you get closer to the shorelines, start looking at coastal regions, and this is where we have the bulk of our energy on these coastal regions when we get close to shore because that's where the water is shallow enough the nutrients are available, and you have your higher primary productivity closest to shore. So when we talk about coral reef formations, they're always close, not always, by and large, they are close to shore because that's how they, that's where they're going to get the right abiotic conditions for those ecosystems to form. All right, so here's a general picture of primary productivity across different ecosystems. Reefs. Now, reefs only make up 0.1% of the ocean or the Earth's surface. But when you look at energy, ba -ba 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 it's about 2,500 grams per square meter of the, ocean, of the world's energy comes from reefs. You look at some of these other areas, open ocean, hardly any energy in the open ocean. All right, so we'll check out more energy in our next lecture.